there we go. And um, so tonight we're going to we have three great speakers. We've Darvel, we have Rachel, and we have Rebecca. And um, so no, I've 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 just stuff written out, you see, and uh, I've now lost it. Um, so. Derval is CEO of Inclusion Ireland, a former speech and language therapist. She now leads the Inclusion Ireland team as they support people with intellectual disabilities to have their rights upheld under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Um, and uh, she'll be talking about deinstitutionalization, the right to housing and the support to live there and inclusive education, which are the three core pillars of Inclusion Ireland's work. So, uh, Derville, I'll call you in there now if you want to take it away. Great. Thanks, Gavin. And thanks by st starting by saying great speakers. Nothing like a bit of pressure at the beginning, you know, but uh, hope, to hope to live up to that. Um, really lovely to be here with you all this evening and um, just to share, I suppose, our work at Inclusion Ireland um, pre-budget and the key concerns that are coming up for people with intellectual disabilities, their families and supporters. So um, to keep myself on track, I, I've just put together a short presentation just with some of the key points to, to mention this evening. And I'm really open to obviously conversation, further debate, questions and, and all of that to bring it a bit more to life. But just to give a little bit of a background to um, Inclusion Ireland, you know, we're the National Advocacy Organisation for People with an Intellectual Disability. Um, we're an NGO, um, a civil society organisation, and we've been at the forefront of the disability rights movement for 60 years now, um, working in partnership with other organisations, um, family support groups and people with intellectual disabilities themselves. Um, our sole purpose in life is to work towards the full inclusion of people with an intellectual disability by supporting people to have their own voice heard and advocating for rights under the UNCRPD. And there's about 66,000 people with intellectual disabilities in Ireland today. But we reckon there's more, but there's just under diagnosis. And, um, and that's a story for another, another day. Um, I suppose what we do in general, just to give you a snapshot of some of the work we do, we campaign for legislative and policy change in line with the UNCRPD. So, for example, right now we're sitting on the advisory group um, for the review of the Education for Spirit. Um, for persons with special education needs, the EPSIN Act. So we sit on that on that advisory group. Um, we run an information and signposting services service so people can contact us. And last year we supported 1,500 people with their own individual concerns and queries. So that could be things like people wondering about their rights and their to benefits or navigating the complex world of, of services and, and education. Um, so we support people either over the phone or um, in written formats with, with supports that they might need. Um, we provide, we're big on accessible information and obviously that's that's one of the, I suppose, the major ways of having your rights met under the UNCRPD is to actually be able to understand information and have information that is presented in ways that you can understand. So we're big on accessible information formats, um, provide information and training opportunities for people and their families, support people to become self-advocates, um, we critique services and supports and constructively provide alternative solutions based on people's lived experience in the real world. Um, and we try to live our inclusive values. So a third of our board have a lived experience of intellectual disability. And everything that we do is informed first and foremost by people with intellectual disabilities alongside their families, allies and supporters. So that's just a kind of a snapshot. So I suppose before budget this year, we 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 every year we run an accessible survey and consultation process to understand the perspectives of people with intellectual disabilities and their families and supporters and the top three issues for people with intellectual disabilities this year were housing and community living access to services and decision making and the assisted decision making act is obviously coming into full force later on this year um, for family members the top three priority issues were access to services, poverty and the cost of disability and education. Now, I'm not going to go into every single one of those issues this evening, but I've just pulled out a few of the highlights and tried to frame it in, I suppose, a way of, you know, what is our ask and what needs to happen and what needs to change to improve things. So 
around housing and community living, obviously this refers to Article 19 of the UNCRPD, which reaffirms the right of people with disabilities to live independently in the community and with the supports that they need to have a good life. But there's a lot of myths about what independent living actually means. And it doesn't mean, it does not mean unsupported living. Um, because for people with intellectual disabilities, there's a range of supports that people might need to live in their own home. That could be ranging from, you know, an hour or two a week of somebody checking in and making sure that the person is, is managing their finances, managing how things are going within the house, right up to people who might need around the clock um, supports to live a full a full life in the community. So I suppose it's it's important to kind of bust some of those, those myths a little bit, because when people are independent living, they think that means unsupported living in a house somewhere. But actually, not, there isn't a single person who lives an unsupported life. And it's just that people need different levels of support depending on their own individual circumstances. And I suppose our key messages coming out of our pre-budget work that there's still 1,300 people under the age of 65 living in nursing homes, disabled people. Um, 2,400 people are still living in institutions or group homes, um, long past the policy, a time to move on from congregated settings. We were supposed to have moved on from institutional living um, by 2018. Um, clearly that has not happened yet. There is some progress being made, but there are still continuing, people are still continuing to live in homes where they never had a choice about where they lived or who they lived with. And there's 1,500 people with intellectual disabilities right now living with family carers who are 70 plus, who never got a chance to move out of their family home and into a home of their own. Um, and for those family carers as well, who never got that opportunity for their son or daughter to move out and into a home of their own. So I suppose our solutions and what we're calling for um, in our pre-budget was the disability capacity review implementation plan to be published. And I'll get onto that on my next slide in a more in-depth way. Um, and a kind of a move and a change of thinking towards more individualized budgets and supporting people to live a life of their choosing and investing in people's right to a home of their own, no matter what level of support they might happen to need to live there. So there are major calls in, in the budget um, this year. And I suppose the disability capacity review, you'll hear Inclusion Ireland talking about this consistently and other organizations um, who are all calling um, for the publication of the implementation plan. So it was the, the disability capacity review was published in July, 2021 by the government. And we've been awaiting the implementation plan since then. And I suppose what the capacity review was, was an overview of um, the unmet need, I suppose, of people with disabilities across the country and disabled people um, from a service perspective. So that was around housing, around services and supports, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I suppose it really laid out, you know, what kind of investment would need to be made over the next number of years to, to get things back on track for disabled people and for their families. Um, and in our view, this is one of the only ways to move on from this, this zone that we find ourselves in, which is about crisis management, to really supporting people in a planned and rights-based way. The only way to support, um, I suppose, people to move into a home of their own, that should never happen just overnight. It needs to be done in a planned way. So then services and supports need to know that they have the funding to do that over a number of years and to do that properly and well with the rights of the person for um, central. But unfortunately right now, because services only get an annual budget, you're really only going to deal with the crisis that's in front of you. And that's where you see inappropriate, I suppose, necessary at the time decisions to be made, but not rights-based decisions being made that really listen to the voice of people. Um, and we also know that even if the Disability Capacity Review Implementation Plan was published and lots more money came into the system over the next number of years to really move away from this crisis and into plan, planning for people's lives, the only way to actually really enable that to happen is to have a really good workforce planning strategy, because ultimately to make it happen, we're going to need people, staff and, and people working in these kinds of jobs to to enable this this to happen effectively over time. So we've also called on that in our budget. Um, and I suppose to us, it's about investing also in a change of thinking. So when I talk about deinstitutionalization or we talk about that in Inclusion Ireland, 
it's really moving on from the old school charity model of, you know, people living in places that they never had a choice over or they never had a choice about who they lived with and moving way beyond that towards supporting a person as a rights holder to make those kind of decisions about their own lives and to be in the driving seat about the kind of supports that they need to have a good life. Um, so we must ensure it's not just about publishing the implementation plan, it's making sure that the thinking moves on as well so that we avoid institutional thinking and avoid that, that way of being. Um, so people just must have choice and control over their lives. Like imagine if where you live was being decided on by a committee you know, that, that's actually the reality that many people with intellectual disabilities face today. A committee might decide where you live because there's a vacancy in a house somewhere. Um, and that's just, it's so against the grain when it comes to the UNCRPD and rights-based approaches. Um, and I suppose I just to tell a story in line with that, um, there's a woman who I have known for, for many a long year and um, she grew up in an institution and lived with 40 other people for most of her life. Um, and she pushed and she got an advocate and she got a lot of support around her. And eventually she moved into a home of her own in the community. She has support. She's somebody who comes in to support her every day. Um, she does need somebody sometimes at night to support her. Um, but she's got it as she describes herself. I have my own front door key for the first time in my life. Um, and for the first couple of months when she moved into her new home, every time she came to her front door, she paused because she never had had that opportunity as a person to just put your own front door key into the front door and walk in. And she describes her life now and it's actually beautiful to listen to. But but it takes time, it takes planning and it takes a different way of thinking to make sure that people have choice and control over their lives. So um, I suppose the next key priority was around the cost of, of disability. And as we all know, we're all in a cost of living crisis at the moment, but I suppose disabled people and their families have faced this crisis for decades now. Um, and in December 2021, the government published its own report, which is called the Cost of Disability Report. Um, and again, we're waiting on an implementation plan around that. Um, and the report found that people with intellectual disability face between nine, €9,000 to €13,000 additional costs every year just because they have a disability, just because they're disabled. And these costs come from things like additional transport costs, light and heat, medications, having to pay for therapies, et cetera. Um, so, so what we're calling for is a cost of disability payment in budget 2023 and to invest in people's lives. And I suppose there's a woman that we work with um, very closely at Inclusion Ireland who told us her story recently. Um, she's 28. Um, she lives in rural Ireland. Um, she has an intellectual disability and she doesn't drive and um, that's not on the cards for her, but she really does want to get into working in the hospitality and catering industry. And she got an offer of a course recently. Um, and because there's no public transport near her um, and it would cost her um, a really high percentage of her disability allowance every week to pay for transport to get to the course, she's actually decided that she had to make a decision between actually eating properly um, over winter or else paying for the transport to go to the course and she chose eating. So she is going to remain stuck in that poverty trap. Um, and it's just an inequitable world in that way. And we need to make the world a little bit fairer for disabled people and people with intellectual disabilities. And that's what the cost of disability payment is about. It's not a charitable act. It's just leveling the playing field for people. And that's what we're calling for. Um, we've also called for an increase in social welfare rates of 20 euro per week at a minimum. And obviously looking at creating more employment opportunities for people with intellectual disabilities. And there's some really excellent programs across the country at the moment who are doing just that. And we'd like to see those programs extended and um, evaluated and funded properly over time as well. So there, there are the bits around, around cost of disability. And obviously um, we're, we're very mindful of this coming into winter for people with intellectual disabilities and their family. This is a huge concern. Um, my final, I suppose, point this evening is around inclusive education, and this came out loud and strong in our consultations pre-budget, and you will have seen all the advocacy work that Inclusion Ireland and other organisations, um, including FOSS and, and other people around the table this evening, have been engaged with over the last few months. Um, 
in trying to ensure that every child has their right to education vindicated and that children get to go to their local school with their siblings um, and have the supports they need to thrive and flourish. And I suppose that Inclusion Ireland, the clue is in our name. We are obviously, you know, pushing for a vision around inclusive education. Um, and we know that this is complex and it's not easy and it's going to be, you know, a challenging road ahead. But I suppose there's a lot of myths about inclusive education and we are trying to kind of talk about that publicly because I think when people hear inclusive education they imagine the system as it is now and their son or daughter is sitting in a mainstream class with 28 children and that's not what inclusive education is at all. Inclusive education is about meeting a child exactly where they're at, valuing them, accepting them and figuring out a way to support that child to access the right to education and that might be in all sorts of creative ways um, and the system right now is a bit inflexible I would say very inflexible actually, and um, with very limited options available for children. Um, so therefore, if you don't fit into one of those limited options, you end up maybe on a reduced timetable, um, maybe you don't access an appropriate school place. So we need the whole system to really change. It's not children who need to change, the children are absolutely fine just as they are. It's actually the system that is causing the difficulties for people. So to us, there's like a components of inclusive education and number one, is leadership and we need to see leadership from the highest level in government right down to leadership in individual schools and we need to see people coming on board with this vision for inclusive education and recognizing the value of it and understanding that of course children should have the right to go to their local their local school with the supports that they need to thrive and flourish we get that that's going to take resources and when we talk about resources we're talking about um, schools should have access to therapeutic resources and they should have access to teacher training, um, effective teacher training that is rights based and focused on accepting children for who they are and giving them the supports that they need to access education. And then, of course, the environment needs to change as well. We need schools that are flexible in terms of spaces and places that they have so children can come and go in and out of out of classrooms and get the support that they need in the way that they need it and how they need it to meet their sensory um, and emotional needs. So like our vision is all children going to school together with whatever support they need to make that happen. And that's that seems a long way off at the moment, but I suppose the Ombudsman for Children has held the department and government to account about this and said, yeah, it might take it, it might take time, but every decision from this moment forward should be about building an inclusive education system. Um, and we, you know, we want to see that pathway to for children being valued and an ambition for young people after they leave school. And today I had the absolute honor of being in a room with 55 self advocates with intellectual disabilities in the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission for um, a project that we're running at the moment about supporting people with intellectual disabilities to become media spokespeople and we asked people with intellectual disabilities what did what do they want the public to know about inclusive education what do you want people to know and these are just some of the quotes that I took down today and we'll publish something on this um, over the next month but you know some of the advocates said tell them I belong just like everybody else I felt so isolated in school teachers need training in how to support people who are different like me and this this one both made me laugh and made me cry who came up with the idea that I can't go to school with my sister? Um, there was a really interesting discussion about who came up with this plan in the first place. You know, nobody asked us and here we are. So um, on that note, um, like why invest in education? You know, obviously we're talking about starting inclusion from the beginning and, and showing children you belong, you know, and it's a way of avoiding all of the things we talked about earlier in terms of institutionalization, poverty and marginalization, and preparing all children for the wonderful and diverse world that we all live in, um, promoting acceptance of difference and diverse ways of being. Um, but we have to be, it's not to take away, like sometimes this can be seen as this blue sky thinking. We have to be grounded in the here and now as well and listen to people, to children and their families who need support right now as we try and build this better model. Um, and we know that this isn't easy, but I guess nothing important ever is. Um, so that's the end of my piece this evening. Brilliant. Thank you, Darvel. That was uh, very informative. Um, we'll move straight on there to Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca's going to talk about equipment, 
accessing and funding. I'm just going to talk about the complaints and HC oversight and uh, the cost of disabilities as well. Over to you, Rebecca. Hello. Um, so um, my name is Rebecca and I'm kind of, you know, with Foss and Cork. And I suppose, um, as it currently stands, the vast majority of the equipment issues that we're contacted about are from families in Cork. Um, so uh, we've been told by various people that the budget uh, for equipment, um, and that's aids and equipment, so that would include a wide variety um, of things from bath seats to, um, you know, AAC devices um, to wheelchairs to everything. And... So we have been told by various people that the budget for the whole of Cork for all ages is 30,000 euros. Now, everybody that we've spoken to since has been unable to confirm or deny that figure. Um, that's what we're working off of because we feel that if it was higher, somebody would have corrected us by now, frankly. Um, so 30,000 euros a month for a county the size of Cork is obviously absurdity in the extreme. We have managed to access the equipment policy for Cork and Kerry, um, but to be totally truthful it is extremely unclear one of the biggest issues facing uh, families when they contact their cdnt and um, so that's their children's disability network team under the new progressing disabilities model and um, is that when they explain that they have a difficulty whether it be with a bed or a chair or just with getting out of the house they're given different answers by every staff member that they come in contact with so one of them will tell them that the hse don't do it Another will tell them that there's no point applying because there's no funding. Um, and you often see it, um, you know, that they'll be told that um, they should just pay for it themselves or like there's no real clarity about what is and isn't covered. We've asked for clarity on many areas of the policy for Cork and Kerry, um, in particular relating to wait lists for children with intellectual disabilities who may need a psychologist to sign off on any equipment request. Um, but wait lists for psychology in Cork South Lee are actually eight years and counting. So obviously you can't get a psychologist to sign off on a piece of equipment if you're waiting for eight years to see the psychologist. Um, our experiences have shown us that when money is in our hand and not the HSE, we can get what our children need very, very easily. Uh, one family were told by the HSE that it would be a minimum of 18 months wait um, and it would depend on what other requests went in the months that they applied as to whether or not theirs would be approved. They couldn't actually leave the house at the time and um, so they rang HC21 which is the same rep as their local disability network team use. Uh, HC21 were at their house within 24 hours with the loan, uh, loan equipment um, and the piece of equipment itself was actually delivered to their door within six weeks with an apology for the delay due to Brexit. And um, if families had access to personal budgets for equipment, then these issues would be gone overnight. Um, the RAG process is unnecessarily complex and clearly it's not working, at least in Cork, for sure. Um, if the system can't provide therapies, then the very least it can do is to simply make existing not so difficult. Uh, Bernard O'Regan has told us that a national policy for the provision of aids and equipments doesn't currently exist, but it has allegedly been in the pipeline for many years thanks to a working group. Um, he stated that each CHO has their own process, um, but that there is no standard to be in 2022 and to not have a national policy on the provision of aids and equipment is, it's just, it's utterly criminal. Um, we have requested the meetings, uh, the minutes of these meetings of this working group. <clears throat> We've been met with a lot of roadblocks in accessing any evidence of this meeting, of these meetings of this group, um, of this group in general, of where they're at in this policy, because they have said that it was it's been in, you know, in the pipeline for years. So there must be a substantial amount of work done by now. And um, we understand that any list would need uh, certain information redacted to protect competition. However, there's absolutely no reason that the items themselves without pricing can't be listed for families to have clarity on what applications can and cannot go in. It would help to improve the relationships uh, between the therapists and the families, because right now that relationship is, is really, really poor. It is very, very poor. Um, so if it was, if families didn't feel like 
they just came up against one mean person who wouldn't, you know, help them, then if they knew, oh, they're working off this policy and this is what the policy says, then it would help to, to kind of repair that relationship that is really, really suffering at the moment. Um, so one of the children um, whose family is involved in FUS recently received her wheelchair after over two years of waiting, two years of speaking to newspapers, TDs, radio stations, and four different promised dates for delivery coming and going with nothing. She finally got her chair. Parts came from all over the world for a chair that could have been built from top to bottom by Stylite in Cork in a fraction of the time because the child's previous three chairs had been. Um, money saving was prioritized over the life and the health of a vulnerable child. These families and more have something in common. They're set at home. They're watching their children suffer due to a lack of basic equipment. While the HSE and the government repeatedly tell us it's not a lack of money. But if it's not a lack of money, then why isn't this equipment easily, easily available? Why is this budget so small? Um, so it kind of leads into the wider issue of what the cost of disability is um, when you have a child with a disability. Um, so to give an example of the kind of issues that these families are facing, I'll give an example of one, uh, one of many. So first there's the battle for AFOs, which are splints, uh, currently a nine to 10 month wait from when the measurements are taken. So they're often outgrown by the time they're received. Then there's the battle for a stander, which is basically a piece of equipment designed to assist somebody to stand. Um, this standing equipment is a vital piece of preventative equipment also because it helps with muscle strength, it improves bladder and bowel function, gut mobility, heart and lung function as well. So if you have a funding application, it has to be made for the AFOs, then it has to be made for the stander. Then you have the simple act of seating for a child who may be unable to sit without support. Will they need a special high chair? Can they sit on the couch in the living room while you grab something for the hall? Is that safe for them? Um, if they don't have the right seating, then is that pushing pressure on their joints? Perhaps they already have scoliosis. And um, so that's another funding application for a high chair, maybe for a seat for the living room. But wait, now you can't have it all. But what about getting them into bed? You can't physically lift them anymore. The HSC is no longer funding ceiling hoist, which is an utterly basic piece of equipment for those families that actually need it. Um, a cot may not be suitable uh, due to epilepsy. You might need access for nur night nursing. Uh, maybe they're too old to go in a cot, they're falling out of the beds at home. Then you come on to how will you bathe them? Will you be able to pay to create a wet room? Will you then be able to pay again for suitable bathing and toileting aids, which will need regular replacing as the child grows? This is before you leave the house. Can you pay 3,000 to 12,000 euros for a car seat? Have you got a wheelchair adapted vehicle? How will you leave the house? Do you buy a special buggy? Do you buy a wheelchair? Your child has something they want to say. Can you self-fund the communication device on top of all this? I hope you're not renting because you'll need to knock that wall to fit a ramp. The eye appointments at COH are cancelled indefinitely, but your child is at high risk of blindness. Will you go private? Will you pay for the physio yourself, the OT, the speech and language, the private insurance needed to cover it all? Maybe you don't have a diagnosis just yet. Will you pay the specialists, the geneticists, the seizure monitor that costs two grand, but might actually allow you a night of sleep. Then there comes the assessments. Um, maybe you went to a psychologist um, who it turned out was unregulated because psychologists are not covered by Coru registration. And um, so therefore it's not accepted by the HSE. So you're gonna self-fund your equipment, your therapies. Maybe they won't give you your assessment. So maybe you're then gonna have to pay for going to court um, to try and vindicate your child's right under the Disability Act. Then maybe you've got a 4 p.m. appointment up at Temple Street. That's a tr another trip to Dublin. Um, you know, a, a late in the day appointment for a family who lives in Cork, that's, you know, 300 euros. Uh, that's 300 euros for a night in Dublin. If they're only up in COH, you know, it's 30 euros a day for parking. Uh, you know, we've all been in the position where we get out to the car, we realise that the nurse could have given us like 10 euros off it and we're looking at the child who we really, really need to get home and we're going, is it worth me dragging this child and all of their bags up, back upstairs for 10 euros? You know, um, and then on top of all of that, you have means testing for carer's allowance, um, which is utterly, you know, it's, it is, it's pure cruel. Um, 
you've got the fact that they're, you know, even just today where they're talking about the new pension um, system, but it, it, it fails to, it fails to consider the vast number of carers who are completely invisible to the system because they're locked out by the means testing. Um, and, you know, it, it, puts, it puts women at risk because women are typically the ones who take on caring roles um, because they don't have financial independence. Um, it, you know, they won't have that pension unless their partner is earning below the threshold for them to be considered a carer, even though they're doing exactly the same job. Um, so like, for example, I, when my daughter was born, um, shortly after, I would have taken carer's allowance or carer's benefit, which is where you can take a two year break uh, from your job and your job will be kept open for you and you can um, be in receipt of 220 euros a week. Um, now, obviously, 220 euros a week when you are paying for all of those things, I mean, occupational therapy is you know 120 euros a session you might need that every week speech and language then every month you know and the list just goes on and on and on unfortunately um but like when june comes i will no longer be in receipt of carers benefit and i won't be entitled to carers allowance but my caring role will not have changed in any way shape or form from june to july but the contribution that carers make to the state is just completely, it's completely overlooked. Um, so there's also, you know, the fact that it's the appointments with it, you know, everyone's experiencing the same, I suppose, but I, what, what a lot of families um, of children with disabilities and people with disabilities themselves are experiencing is that it might have been that they had to get this one thing but then maybe this other thing they had a little help with. Now it's, every, you know, the, the entire collapse of children's disability services, along with COVID wait lists on top of everything. It's just, you know, you, then you have to go private to see this person. You have to go private to see that person. And it just adds up and up and up. And if we actually means tested carers and we removed all of these things that they're actually paying out for, you'd find that most of them were in a deficit like that's the reality that most people are living in a gross amount of debt just to get from one end of the week to the other. Um, if you were to try and, you know, make a complaint um, about, you know, maybe your child not getting an assessment under the, the Disability Act or, you know, not getting access to the, these basic supports and, or even just information, to be totally honest with you, because we're at the point now where they don't even have enough staff to give you the most basic of information. I actually recently, you know, had the privilege of, of meeting Dervil and I, I actually said to her, I said, you are the first person that I have spoken to since my child was diagnosed with an intellectual disability who like has been able to explain what, what that means, you know, like, and, and that's, that's, that should never be it should never be like that. Somebody should always, we should always at, at the very least have somebody to like answer a handful of questions for, for a family. Like this is, it, it's just inhumane. Um, so if you go and try and make a complaint uh, within the HSE and within the CDNTs, um, each service provider has a separate complaints procedure. So um, you can file a complaint about an issue which happens within a CDNT. However, if you complain about a lack of intervention within the CDNT, they will simply just close it off and say, yeah, we're working on it, very, it's very tough. And, and that's kind of the end of the story. However, if you make a complaint about kind of the overall service, about how something's being done, um, about where you feel improvements could be made, you can escalate those complaints via the correct channels. But once you reach the end of the complaints process, whether your complaint has been upheld or not, um, you won't get satisfactory results and your child will be kicked out of their CDNT. Um, you can file complaints, you can escalate them as per the policy, and then you're just stonewalled with silence because there's nobody to respond to it. It violates every HSE policy on protecting complainants and it silences families because it is unfortunately a very frequent occurrence, for example, within FOSS, 
um, that bullying and intimidation of families who advocate are frequently reported. Many of our own members have received intimidating phone calls from CAMs and from CDNTs, especially following media exposure. Uh, we've had families who have been uh, kicked out of their CDNTs, um, which is, you know, extremely punitive, even though it's kind of, you know, it's, it's said not to be punitive, but if you're kicking a child out of a CDNT in the middle of a crisis, Re the reality is they're not going to be seen by anybody else. Um, family frequently report being referred to as difficult uh, for simply asking for support. Um, during the course of one complaint, it was discovered via Freedom of Information uh, that a CDNT staff member had raised serious concerns to the management about a lack of supervision within a job that they'd only been in for a matter of weeks. Um, a year later, that staff member is now looking for employment elsewhere because their concerns were completely ignored. Um, we we have a situation now where staff don't feel that they can say anything. Families don't feel, everybody is in this kind of wall of silence and we have no way to get through it because when the staff make a complaint, they're shut down, they're not protected, there's no dialogue. Um, and then families are being stonewalled as well and they're feeling they're feeding that back to the to the therapists and saying why you know why are you doing this or you know feeling like at, at when it's the system that they're working within and that then leads to obviously staff I mean nobody wants to go into work if that's the environment you know at the end of the day um but we need to we need to act now to ensure that families concerns are heard that there's a clear structure of governance um and you know that we are protecting people who are making these complaints because you know, as families, we do have this unique viewpoint and um, they're they're in, you know, they're in the office and they're looking at like this part and this part and they're saying, OK, well, that works really, really well. I don't know what they're all given out about, whereas nobody knows. And this is just a this is an absolute fact. Nobody has any idea right now how to get from A to B in children's disability services. The people who work within it will gladly tell you that. The people on the outside trying to navigate it will also gladly tell you that. It is completely, it's just, it's just so unnavigatable uh, that nobody, nobody can get from A to B. So, yeah. That's it. Sorry. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, we'll roll straight into Rachel there, the uh, uh, Dublin organiser for FOSS. Rachel, if you want to take it away hello lovely to see some familiar faces and some new faces um i'm gonna go right back to the beginning i suppose um and look at pds so pds is what we call the progressing disability services that's what the children's disabilities come under and unfortunately the budget given to children's disability is is six percent of the 2.2 billion that is given to disability services so to cover therapies equipment everything we're looking at 3.5 million, which is just, it's crazy. When we have, uh, the latest figures is 200,000 children on waiting lists around the country nationally. And this is the budget kind of that we're dealing with. So obviously this year in this budget, we want to see a massive increase uh, on that budget that's allocated to, to children's disability services. Um, Dervil, I know, mentioned the disability uh, capacity review and I would totally echo her sentiments there that the, the implementation plan needs to be published like immediately, like yesterday. Um, you know, and. And again, I would echo the fact that we are using multi-annual budgets or we're using annual budgets when we need to use multi-annual budgets, because as you said, annual budgets just results in crisis management and nothing else. Um, and, you know, another issue that we see constantly with, with HC is the lack of data that's collected, but not only the lack of data that's collected, we then use that data that's old, so five years old, say, in terms of the disability capacity review, the data is from 2017. So we're using data that's five year old to predict up to 2032 what kind of budgets we're going to need not only that then the data that they do use they're predicting using static data so they're not actually accounting for population change for growth and disabilities etc so we're never going to use that kind of um method we're not going to meet not only the unmet need but future need as well um, I know there's a study in the UK that said, in, and it was particular to children with disabilities, if you spend one pound now, you will actually save six pounds in the future in terms of supporting these, these children when they're adults um, and going forward. So 
obviously that's something that we need to hammer home is that if you spend now you will actually save in the future and that's if nothing else if it's not the moral or the ethical side at least we can appeal to um you know the, the financial side of people to save money to the taxpayer for saving money um going forward from i'm going to talk about um recruitment and retention within the hc and obviously um, what we need to see there is, is accountability, which we just don't see at the moment, and transparency with HSE. Obviously, since first starting in February of this year, we've had a lot of um, freedom of information, parliamentary questions, just to get basic figures on how much staff is in each children's disability network team. Obviously, I think we all know by now that there's 91 children's disability network teams around the country, and not one of them is fully staffed. Um, most are operating between 28 and 30% 30, uh, 30 vacancies. Um, and the caseloads then again are massive so the caseloads you're talking about I know in my area you're talking about 1100 children to what was 20 therapists which they've now lost another six so you know we're down to 15 14 therapists where I am in Meath so you're talking about a massive caseload and I know the you know the gold standard caseload would be that you have 40 children to one therapist so obviously we are so far above it it's it's frightening um, the HSC lost 2,000 staff in 2021 alone. Um, I will echo what Daryl said, we need a costed workforce plan. It was promised, we're still waiting. Um, I know Sinn Féin have kind of put out figures of 10 million for recruitment and retention, or just recruitment. Retention seems to be eternally forgotten in these conversations and it's extremely important because we have very highly skilled therapists in this country and we are going to lose them if we don't treat them. Um, as valuably as they are. Um, when we spoke, I suppose we had a meeting with Michal Martin, we spoke about international recruitment and that's something that the HSC um, are looking at at the moment. We were promised the workforce plan um, actually by today um, and have yet to see it. But in terms of international recruitment, my, our concerns there would be, obviously we have a cost of living crisis in Ireland at the moment. We also have a housing crisis um, and our transport is not much better. So where are these people going to live? How are they going to afford to live here when the wages are subpar in terms of other countries? Um, and then another issue that comes up constantly is clinical supervision. If a therapist comes um, from another country, be it European or otherwise, they actually need clinical supervision hours uh, here in, in Ireland. And obviously we are wor working on vacancies of 30% in most CDNTs. So how are they going to get those clinical hours when, when the people there can't manage their caseloads as it is? You know, without addressing the retention of staff, I think, you know, international recruitment is is... is futile at the moment and um, I know the Irish Association of Speech and Language Therapists put out a statement to say that they are looking for over 300 placements for the current students that they have uh, for clinical supervision um, and those th those students should be starting those placements you know now and they're short 300 placements because CDNTs just aren't in a position to take them on and um, obviously our our closest neighbour would be Northern Ireland and the UK and that's a completely untapped resource um, in terms of recruiting um, staff and that comes down to some qualification differences. They, there's a, particularly in speaking, speech and language, there's a module that they don't have in swallowing that we do have here. And unfortunately, they cannot meet the core regulation standards, so we can't actually employ them. So I suppose in the budget, we'd love to see something put in for, in higher education for you know, that module to be completed so that they can be core registered so we can actually recruit from, from Northern Ireland and the UK, which would be kind of our closest neighbours. Um, I suppose it, I can't talk about recruitment without and retention without talking about our Section 39 workers who did actually go on strike today. And um, I know Forza were out on strike today in Kerry and Cork and Galway, I think. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, HSC staff would be Section 38, and then the Section 39s would be the voluntary bodies, the likes of Enable Ireland, CRC, um, Brothers of Charity, all those that are kind of subcontracted by the HC. But the massive difference there is the HSE workers get paid on average three to five thousand euro more a year than the likes of Enable Ireland. So a speech and language therapist in HSE would be paid five thousand more than a speech and language therapist in Enable Ireland, even if they're a mile down the road doing the exact same job. Not only that, is their salary different? Um, they don't get the same sick leave. Section 39 workers only get 70% maternity leave, whereas HC staff get 100 percent maternity leave. And obviously, in a female dominated um workforce that that's something that needs to be addressed and um, they don't get the same pension um, contributions and then obviously we've talked about conditions in terms of staff um, and caseloads ratios and then obviously the HSE culture which we all know exists and nobody seems willing to address um, and I just want to read something out in terms of retention 
that uh, Assault actually released in a statement and the statement hasn't been picked up by mainstream media nor has it been addressed by anybody in government even though it calls um, pro the rollout of progressing disability services a failure and a risk to the children and the staff that are working there um, and these are therapist words I feel the children are being neglected in the rollout of PDFs I feel devastated that I'm part of that I'm desperately trying to hang on to my career the safe option is to walk away which I don't want to do with over 20 years as a speech and language therapist, it's my identity, it's my job, it's what I love, but people are taking career breaks just to get out. So there are obviously issues that we need to address with retention. These are all issues that we brought up with our Taoiseach Michal Martin at our meeting. Um, I was accused of being naive in, in suggesting that Section 39 workers could get some pay parity. Um, but yeah, he couldn't provide us with a figure of what that would actually cost. Um, I haven't seen anyone provide us with a figure. Um, obviously, then, if you look at untapped um, workforces in terms of recruitment, carers is completely untapped workforce. Obviously, they can work 15 hours and, and maintain their carers allowance. But unfortunately, a lot of courses like um, OT assistance, uh, speech and language assistance, all of those, they are, go over the 18.5 hour threshold. So even though a lot of them are online and they could do them from home and they could get back into the workforce by working 15 hours, they're actually completely locked out of furthering their education. And then obviously if their caring role ends at some point in the future, they are again, completely locked out of the workforce because they've been at home caring um, for years on end. So again, carers is a completely untapped resource and something that the budget completely needs to address. Um, I know this week we've seen a lot of controversy, particularly on Twitter, about family forums. Family forums um, were supposed to be rolled out in, uh, under PDS in 2011, and they were not. It's basically a, to explain it really easily, is a meeting between, you know, the, the staff, a manager from a service, a HSC manager, and service users, parents, whoever, so if there's any policy changes, they are run by the service users. If there's any you know, concerns, the service users can feed them back to the management. And unfortunately, we're not seeing the forums happen. Now, I know this week um, there were meetings to set up forums. There was a lot of anger at those meetings, which I can completely understand, it's completely justified. People need a space to vent um, their frustrations over you know, being let down, being neglected over the last number of years. However, FUS has ad advocated for family forums and will continue to advocate for family forums because I think it's one way that we will get accountability from the HSC. It's one way we will get transparency from the HSC. And as Rebecca has mentioned already, it's a way of improving the relationships between CDNTs and the service user. Um, you know, if there was a policy in terms of saving money or, you know, from a budgetary concern, PDS was a policy that was rolled out it didn't have um, service user buy-in. It didn't have a lot of the professional bodies buy-in. Um, a lot flagged their concerns very early on, like Psychological Society of Ireland, Speech and Language, OT, all flagged their concerns earlier on and were ignored. But I feel like if the family forums were established, we would have that feedback between, and we would know very, very early on that service users were not buying into policy. So we wouldn't be spending time and money making policies that we're not actually going to be bought into and not going to be successful. Um, Obviously, then on the other side of that, if we did have family forums, that's a space for families to vent. So you're going hopefully going to see an, a decrease in complaints and hopefully see a decrease in freedom of information um, requests, which again would decrease administration costs around the country. Um, and obviously, these are all future costs. This is not going to happen straight away, but it's something that you know needs to be considered. And then we do know the HC that we know have spent 2.1 million on legal costs in 2021. And we would hope if there was more transparency in terms of you know across the board policy vacancies budget budget spent budget not spent just transparency across board we would hope that we would see a reduction in those legal costs because family wouldn't feel like you know court was their was their only option so um i would love to see the family forms rolled out and i would love to see families and uh, staff buy into them i think it's really important um for us to repair and to move forward um in terms of carers i know rebecca has touched on carers already um, the means test, obviously, as she said, locks out a vast proportion of the of people who are caring and puts, you know, it's predominantly women who do the caring role. And it, it does put them in, in a difficult position. Um, it, it takes away their safety. It takes away their financial independence. Um, and I suppose it devalues the caring role. If someone is caring, they're caring, whether their partner whoever that may be, has financial means. It's completely irrelevant to the role and the job that they have taken on. 
Um, the caring community save 20 billion for the state every year, 20 billion. By, t- by caring for their children at home and their and their adults as well. Um, I suppose in an ideal world, I'd love to see carers getting a living wage. Um, I know the put payment was 350 and the tarnish has said that was the bare minimum that um, people could live on at that time. I would love to see carers get 350 euro a week. I would love to see um, the disability allowance rise to 350 euro a week. I think realistically that's not going to happen, but I would love to see an increase across the board in the budget. Um, I would love to see the means test annihilated um you know the the carers allowance is a taxed allowance so if you pay tax on it but unfortunately even to get an eye test is is extremely difficult because your prsi contributions are not there so you have to claim off your spouse or you have to claim back it's extremely difficult to actually um access those supports and then obviously there is the household benefits package which can cover you know you get 35 euro and that can cover a part of your heating bill or part of whatever you needed to. Obviously, we know that's not sufficient. Rebecca has gone into some of the costs. Obviously, then other ones would include, you know, we're, we're seeing rising costs in energy and fuel. You know, people with disabilities, they have pressure mattresses, they have electric beds, they have feeding machines, they have nebulizer machines, they have oxygen machines. There's so much that they rely on um, energy for and they cannot afford, obviously, to, to, to not turn on the electricity because they're life-saving life-saving measures for for a lot of their children and um, so i'd love to see the household package either the household benefits package increased or a cap on energy bills would be fantastic whether we'll see it who knows and um, obviously bin charges then i know has been flagged with us as an issue for families who are, have to use incontinence wear and that kind of thing that the bin charges are astronomical for them so a cap for those kind of families would be fantastic um, and then in terms of carers allowance and carers disabilities um your carers allowance is actually cut off. If your child is in hospital for more than six months, your carers allowance is discontinued, even though you are still there with your child in the hospital. Um, in fact, your, your costs probably go up when your child is in a hospital. Your, dis, your carers allowance is discontinued after uh, six months. If you yourself are in hospital, your carers allowance is also discontinued after um, 13 weeks, actually, if you're in hospital yourself. Same goes for DCA, that's discontinued. DCA is a domiciliary care allowance, it's once a month payment, and that's also discontinued if you are in hospital. Um, or your child's in hospital for more than six months. Rebecca has touched on the pension scheme um, for carers. While it's welcome, unfortunately, it only recognises carers from 2024 onwards. So people who have done a lifetime of caring are completely locked out of that, um, which is unfortunate. And, you know, I would love to see that addressed and overturned. Um, But yeah, ultimately, I think we need to see a massive increase in the budget for disability services um, this year. Thanks, Millian. Brilliant. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, thanks to all three speakers. Um, before I open it up to questions or comments there, Rebecca, do you want to say anything there about the uh, preliminary team assessments? Well, um, so I suppose to, just to kind of explain what they are and stuff, is it? Yeah. OK, so the preliminary team assessment was basically what they brought in um, in order to kind of shirk the responsibilities that, you know, the Disability Act. The Disability Act is really, really clear. It says that every child is, is entitled to have the nature and extent of their disability determined. And that is really, really clear. And so what the preliminary team assessment sought to do was to, to turn a very in-depth um, assessment process into a 90 minute screening appointment. So for example, um, our child would have had one last year. Um, sh- the outcome, the, there would have been, um, there was two therapists in the room and a third one was in the room on a laptop via Zoom. And they watched her play for 90 minutes and they felt that that was enough information to deem her to have a disability as defined by the act. So we got a piece of paper that said, your child meets the terms of the Disability Act as having a disability. And we said, okay, fair enough. What does that mean? Nobody can tell you, no idea. So I said, does she have autism? Don't know. Does she have an intellectual disability? Don't know. Do you have any idea what it is? No, they don't because they haven't spent very long with her and they're making a pure snap judgment from just being in the same room for 90 minutes you can't like it's it's bananas so 
what we would have done is we went to court. Um, we went to court with many other families. Unfortunately, that was the only avenue that we had. So, um, it, and the, the High Court determined that the preliminary team assessment did not meet the terms of the Disability Act. Um, and our assessment, the, our actual assessment began within two weeks. The actual assessment involved um, uh, six sessions of playing in the same room with other children while being observed. Um, it involved a speech and language assessment. It involved a physio assessment. It involved um, a cognitive assessment, which was done over, I think it was six appointments. Uh, it involved a home visit. It involved a play-based clinic assessment. Like that's the difference. And then when we came out of that, we had a, love, a report that said, here is what we recommend. This is what kind of schooling your child should get. And so that is, that is what every child who is applying for an assessment of need should be getting. But unfortunately, what we are finding is that this 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 kind of absolute because you know this is it's this people want this for school that's what they want it for they don't want it they know they're not kind of that the services aren't really there right now they literally just want this for school you can't get into an early intervention unit without these um without these reports you can't get into a special school if you don't know if your child needs a special school or not. Um, so it's really, really basic stuff, um, especially given the wait lists for these kinds of schools. Um, so unfortunately, we saw we had um, a memo today. Um, it was dated today, um, which uh, now these should have all been this. I mean, the High Court, this was settled. This was settled as far as families was concerned. Um, but we saw a memo from just today um, in which uh, it says that preliminary team assessments are um, a waitlist easing measure still being used in Cork and Kerry. And I think we're all, I think we all know realistically that it's not just Cork and Kerry. And the difficulty is because we are supporting a couple of families who are fighting this at the moment. Um, the normal procedure, if you want to go to court, is that you have to make a complaint under the Disability Act then your complaint has to be upheld. And then that gives you a path to the district court. Um, that paperwork isn't even being returned. Um, and there's a lot of very concerning behavior happening to families where we've had people who were told, oh yeah, if you fill out this paperwork, then we'll do your, we'll start the assessment next week. Um, and then when an advocate left, that stopped attending meetings or if somebody if an advocate went on maternity leave or anything like that um, then unfortunately that appointment was actually cancelled because without sufficient pressure that child unfortunately was was not going to get that assessment so it's very concerning because this is this this matter was completely settled in the high court there it's it's a completely unlawful procedure um, and families are getting no choice in it they're being pushed back into it, but now they can't even go back to court about it. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. So I'll uh, I'll just shoot back to Dervil there. Is there anything you would like to add um, at this point before I open up to questions? I don't think so, Gavin. I'm just happy to take questions if people would like. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So does anyone have any questions they want to come in with there? Uh, NASA, you're very welcome. Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm sitting on my stairs because between dinner and homework and uh, everything else and bedtimes, it's like the only quiet place in my house. So apologies if I look mad and uh, it looks like I'm in a haunted house. Um, so actually, before I before I ask my question, I, I just wanted to say to Rebecca about that issue of um, finding out the money. I'm sure you have loads of people to ask for PQs, but I'm more than willing to get involved if, if you want to have a bit of help finding out the number. Now, full disclosure, the HSE down in Cork hate my guts because of the own occur closure. <laughs> they absolutely hate me and I have them dragged up in front of PAC on uh, next week, next Thursday. Actually, maybe we should ask them next Thursday in front of everybody. <laughs> that might be the thing to do. Um, so they hate my guts, but we might we might ask a few questions of them. Um, so there's a couple of things. Um, one, I, and I just I, I am really 
interested in the family forums thing and getting that up and running because I think that if we could get so my experience with the HSC is it's completely opaque and how they relate then to other institutions can be really opaque as well and if we could kind of get them to open up to kind of more collaborative models they could actually like they might embrace it across a number of forums and it might actually help other groups as well um because there's so many areas where you could have that kind of level of family involvement or advocacy um you know be making policy and making services i guess my question is um do we have like we've like even just in the presentations tonight there's been a lot of talk about like the complaint system and like what do you do when it's going wrong because obviously it's going wrong a lot and how um frustrated people get and how you have to then you know resort to the courts and that's more expense again and um i was at the ncbi launch of their equitable education report today and there was a girl talking about when she was in university and she described it as a closed loop so there was no kind of free and transparent way to complain everything was like you were shunted to one person and then another group and then you were kind of it was all a kind of a closed loop to kind of keep you on a treadmill and you never kind of got to the end of it and one of the things that we talked about at disability matter that i brought up with the chair michael moynihan was like do we have like should there be a book that stops somewhere and do instead of like we have the children's commissioner should we have a uncrpd Irish commissioner where the book stops and they can escalate very quickly personal complaints in a way that maybe I don't know I suppose my question is do we need to kind of start from scratch with the complaint system and reimagine it completely from a, a rights-based model because at the moment it feels like we're in this closed loop of institutions and it's all about like servicing the institution and doing you know you go from the court to the institution and back again that's my question. Um, I'll jump in there. Um, yeah, like in, I think in an ideal world, the complaints procedure would be completely taken away and be an independent body that's not associated with the HC at all. Um, and I think that's the only way that we will get through transparency and accountability. Um, you are right in, in saying that it is completely closed loop. It is absolutely 100% you get to the end of it. Um, we have, I suppose, responses from families who have gotten to the end of, of the loop and been told, unfortunately, we're understaffed right now, so we that's a, we can't we can't say anything more than that. And that's that's the response to the complaint they get. Or like myself, I have uh, complaints in on behalf of my children at the moment, and it was escalated to the regional manager because I didn't get a response from the from the original complaint officer. And I've written to the regional manager as instructed and uh, and been stonewalled. So yeah, you're absolutely right. And then obviously if you complain to the ombudsman, if your complaint is open with the HSC, they cannot step in. If the HSC are liaising with you, um, they can't step in. And obviously the ombudsman himself said that after 10 years, when he was walking away, uh, the previous ombudsman, that nothing has changed. Um, in terms of, of disability services. So yeah, my, my feeling would be it should be a completely independent body that's overseeing complaints, absolutely. Okay, good to know. And um, just to say as well, uh, one of the only ways I find with the HSE is if I follow the money. So like, that's the only way we're getting anywhere on the one occur, even though I'm fully certain we're gonna lose that battle, but the only, and so if there was a, like you, you mentioned court cases there and the kind of cost benefit analysis of like, forcing people into court and then what like that might be something to maybe think about like writing to PAC or, or raising with PAC that like is there a cost benefit analysis being done on the HSC around the amount of times and I know it came up with the autism files when that whole thing happened around like pushing people into that space um but I I do think that that's maybe somewhere that like we could progress and put them under a bit of pressure Right. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca Dorver, do you have anything to add to that? Um, we'd always love any help of any kind. Thank you. I'm here. I'm available. And I know the HSE in Cork. <laughs> they love us just as much, so. <laughs> you have a very special HSE down in Cork. That's all I'll say. And I'll for that. Yeah, they, they, they're, they love it. they're loving us. The, the more emails they get, the more they're loving us. 
I just think one other thing, maybe in terms of complaints, we I suppose we can't forget the optional protocol of the UNCRPD as well, um, just for international eyes on us um, in terms of how we're faring under UNCRPD. So um, I think that's something we might need as a collective to start pushing for as well. Um, I know there's been noise about it over the last couple of years, but maybe a, a bringing together people who all share that sense of the importance of it might be um, an interesting thing to do over the next few months as well. I completely agree. And just to say that the sense I get from Anne Rabbit is that she fully intends to do that, but she, she often doesn't get, like I find her pretty good, I'll be honest with you, but she's just not getting the support that she needs. So on things like the family forums, she, there's real frustration there. And I think she is trying to, like she, she keeps saying that she's serious about the optional protocol. So I, I kind of live in hope maybe too much hope. Brendan, you have a question there, do you want to come in? I do, thanks Kevin, thanks Darrell, Rebecca, and Rachel, really interested listening to you. Uh, just a quick question, just something you said, Rachel, just to go back to, the data that's available from the HSE and, and the unavailability of data, I know Oshin Smith is doing work with the open data and I know on the environmental side of things, there's a good few activists around Ireland who are pushing for data from the Department of Agriculture on different things, which creates pressure of its of its own sense. And it's also, you know, good stuff for media and, and communications. Is, is there anything that can be pressure in that regard put on the HSE to be more transparent? Uh, and I know like Gavin is down here in Cork with us. Uh, if there was anything in that regard that you wanted to pass on or any research that can be done in the background? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know when we initially started six months ago, uh, Brendan O'Regan, who or Bernard O'Regan, apologies, who is the head of disability operations, um, had stated that a new data system would be up and running by the autumn, which we are yet to see um, because the data systems used for assessment and need and for collecting um, data on children who are accessing CDNTs and primary care um, are so outdated that they're not actually functional and they're not uh, cohesive so they can't access true uh, tr true data uh, in real time and that's something that we were promised would be in by this autumn so um, press any pressure around that new data system would be absolutely fantastic because I think real time figures is what, what we need Cool, thanks Rachel Rebecca, you have your hand up there. Sorry. Um, so yeah, it's just as well to say on the kind of data collection uh, front, one kind of issue that tends to happen a lot is um, that they'll release primary care figures and they'll release them at the same time as they'll, there'll be like a one sentence and it'll say, due to blah, 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 we cannot release information about section 39. Now, from the pieces of data that we have kind of pieced together, we know that CHO4, which is Cork, is the worst in the country. Uh, we know that um, a very large portion of Cork is served by a Section 39 organization. So therefore, we have no way of accessing those figures. And like, when we're looking at the, we, we don't even know how many children, like we were only talking about this earlier this evening, um, if we're trying to get an accurate figure of how much these therapists are being spread out over Cork, for example, then all of the we have to go through all the different children's network disability teams. And we're going like I rang one earlier, for example, and I said, how many children are in your caseload? And they said, who's this? Why do you want to know? You'll have to put that in writing and then I'll find out if I can tell you. Um, they're, the names of these children's network disability teams on, on the HSE website would be things such as co-action, CDNT11, CDNT5, and etc. So we have, for example, seen one that's called CDNT14. So you'd think, oh, well, there's 14 CDNTs, but there's 11 on the website. It's this kind of absolute nonsense. And it's just... They're, they're constant every time um, they get a, a, a PQ about about lists, they say, this is how many children are waiting for a first contact. 
which is like a thousand children, okay? Um, and then they'll say, and here's the primary care figures. The children who are waiting for CDNT services, those are the numbers that we need to find out. We need to find out how many are in their caseload and they're doing an extremely good job of hiding it from everybody. Just to follow up quickly on that, just on the data, do you talk to any legal experts in it? Because I know, again, a similar thing with the environment, like Fred Logue would have been somebody about getting data and information under AIEs, which is access to information about the environment. Is there any legal advice on what the HSC have to give out? Or has anybody taken a case against them on, on a data basis? Uh, I, not that I'm aware of. Uh, we do have a couple of barristers who are kind of uh, quietly helping us in the background uh, very nicely, uh, but no one, I suppose, official is, is what I'd say there. Um, yeah, in terms of we've been just doing freedom of information requests and parliamentary questions kind of ourselves to access information. And then obviously we would have a number of whistleblowers who would send us internal memos and that's how we kind of get a lot of our information is we've uh, we've a great following of therapists who help us out um along the way but yeah it's yeah brilliant thanks uh, is there any other questions that anyone else wants to come in on there No, okay. Oh, sorry, John, go on. It's just a comment, really. I mean, I shouldn't be, I, and, and this is hopefully supportive in some way, and it's been an eye-opener for me. Uh, I thought I knew a little bit about this, not at first hand. And I work in the youth sector, and I work with, um, in the youth mental health sector, and I see, I see what happens there. And it's like um, the same themes, the same culture. And, you know, I was writing down a few words earlier on when I, when I was listening to all three of you speak so eloquently and um, almost overwhelming the amount, like it must be very, very difficult. Um, but just like the concept of full citizenship is very important and like for, for everybody involved in the family, um, like autonomy, things like that. It's just shocking. I mean, really, I, I'm, I, I have a million questions, so I won't even ask uh, one question, but um, it's been an eye opener for me, I have to say, and I thought I knew a bit, but I know I, I realize now that I don't. Um, but I think we're dealing with, you know, from from the sector I come from, um, youth sector, um, you know, CAMS and all that we've seen the kind of recent issues there. And, you know, when you're when you're talking into that system, I work for a Section 39 organization, youth, youth organization, youth and community. And when you're talking into that system, you're nobody like. I advocate, I, I, I attend meetings with young people, meeting with social workers and stuff like that. And, and this isn't a comment on the individual social worker in, in a sense, they're victims of a horrible system as well, without, you know, but that's their choice. And they have a choice in the matter, I suppose. But there is a culture there, which is like, it is, it is deny, deny, deny. And this kind of, the, the, the information, the data probably serves just to divide and conquer, doesn't it? It's like, if you had all the information in one in one place, you could kind of say this is the situation, uh, and everybody knows it. But um, yeah, sorry, I, <laughs> I just my mind is blown. But uh, thanks for the, to the three of you for that, and uh, yeah, solidarity, and it's 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 terrible, and we'll we'll keep working to progress it. But um, just very important information. Thank you, thank you, you all three for for speaking so eloquently. Thanks. Thank you, John. Carol, do you want to ask a question or have a comment? Um, I'm an SNA and I've I've worked with Rachel and Dervan. I haven't met Rebecca before, but I've never heard so much. Hello. I've never heard so much uh, information put together so well. So I really hope we can, when it goes on Zoom, we can share this far and wide. It's been absolutely amazing. The three of you, the three aspects. Um, and just to reiterate, I think Rachel said, I'm a rep for Forza, I'm an SNA, but I'm a rep for Forza. The Section 39 workers are on strike at the moment. So I would encourage people to get out and, and uh, solidarity with them. And we can see what the impact it's having on, on the disability sector. So that's my little two cents. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, uh, we certainly support you and um, the, 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 the work that all the all the therapists do is so important for all our kids 
and uh, you know the the way things are at the moment is is, is grossly unfair and like parity is very much the least that uh, should be granted between the various organizations or the, the manner in which people are are employed to do their job like um that's brilliant yeah uh so some thanks there in the chat as well um does anyone else want to have make any comment there i do you know what i'm just going to jump in i literally just got a message um from her therapist and i'm just going to jump in because it's actually really apt to what we're talking about um, she literally just messaged me there and said, just been told not to offer therapy to families who have confirmed they're going private, which is actually against their own policy. So there you go. Can confirm. Um, we were told last year uh, and we said, we knew the policy and we said, but you're not, you're not, you're not. And they were like, well, we don't want to double up. We don't want to double up on, on programs. Um, so we left the private sector committed to the public sector, uh, realized what a gross mistake that was, uh, tried to get back into the private sector. Private sector is too overwhelmed now, said, sorry, we actually aren't dealing with complex cases because we don't have the staff nope. and we don't have the, tra they don't have the training required. So, and that will be in a lot of, um, of the kind of centers in Cork, so. Yeah, very much what would happen to us, Joe, a number of years ago, like we'd have, Said it's the over job doing this privately as well, and then there was nothing, <laughs> nothing ever since either. Uh, unfortunately, and like we're not the we're we're not we're not alone in that either. Like you know, there's the it's an awful lot of fun and just can't can't make any contact with their their teams. Don't have any contact. You know, like at this stage, I don't even know who who we should be contacting on our team because like Joe. Rachel was talking about like the uh, the retention issue, like the who, who who's who's leading up the teams. It changes regularly, and you've so little contact you actually don't know. So you're sending, you're trying to make contact with people who, who are no longer there, which is uh, which is incredibly difficult. Right. Okay. So does uh, does anyone else want to want to come in there with any questions or comments? Just just can I just say one last? <laughs> so, um. The Charities Act as well, what is, what one of, one of the functions of it is to, is to gag us as well, as in, you know, you can't really be seen to, to, to campaign. Um, you know, when you're working with young people, we young people are fantastic. That's why I, I'm still working with them. They're fantastic and they're, 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 they don't care about rules and they'll, they'll, sh they'll, they'll speak up at conferences and they'll embarrass everybody, which is fantastic. I, lo I love that because that's what we need more of. Um, you know, people actually advocating for themselves and not being polite, because why would you want it? Why would you be polite? Um, but I just think one of the things, and I saw it a number of years ago when the Charities Act, you know, has, has you know, I've been in the sector a long time, 30 years, and you can kind of see this kind of creeping control coming in. And even almost now funders kind of almost micromanaging and managing us. And th that's from a funding point of view, look, we're, we're we're spending public funds, so that's fine. I, I, I've no issue. And the charity sector probably, and by and large, um, is, is the most responsible sector in, 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 in terms of we don't get much money anyway. But there is that creeping control, right? There's a culture of control. Um, and, you know, when we have to be very careful when we have a, you know, sometimes we have a mental health campaign. And I've, I've actually said internally, I'm not doing any more mental health campaigns because the stigma isn't families are on the street or other people, you know, because people, young people talk about their mental health all the time and it's great. It's actually when you go to the services, that's where the stigma is. When you can't get a service, when a young person goes to GF in, in, um, in Cork, the regional, I still call it the regional, I've shown my age. Um, but like when they go there and they're suicidal and they're given a leaflet and they're sent home, like there's something wrong there. Do you know what I mean? And, and I, I think like the whole concept of intersectionality, this is, I mean, this is a, sh I'm, I'm shocked and I'm not easily shocked. I've been in this business a long time, but I'm actually shocked by what I'm hearing tonight. It is shocking. It's disgusting. and It's outrageous. And these are citizens. These are our fellow citizens. And I just think this is um, absolutely horrendous. And I can see what there is at this culture of control um, that needs to be addressed and it needs to be tackled. You know, there needs to be more. The heart needs to come back in, and the head 
we need a head. We need, you know, what the bean counters have been, have been. And I think when you do, like, I know there was some research done a number of years ago, like you spend one euro in the youth sector and sorry to go on about the youth sector, but it's the one I know, but I think it's applicable. Um, when you spend one euro in the youth sector, you save seven euro in the long run. You know, you're keeping people out of institutions, you're keeping them out of jails, you're keeping them out of, you know, where the real money is spent. So yeah, sorry, that's just, yeah. <laughs> I don't mean to talk all over you because you know much more than I do, but I'm just trying to echo, you know, in some way. Um, Thanks a million for that, John. Yeah. Um, I suppose I, it was, uh, I just want to, first, I, I never said it actually, I want to thank the, the Just Transition Greens for facilitating this tonight and uh, for allowing me to chair as well. Um, which uh, I, I greatly appreciate personally. Um, I want to thank Derval, Rebecca and Rachel um, for speaking so eloquently and uh, clearly in getting so many of the, the issues across. John, do you want to come in there? Oh, clapping grand. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Just Transition Greens. Uh, thanks as well, uh, NASA, for finding the time to show up and to uh, take part. And um, I'm sure everyone is uh, very grateful for your offer of support. Um, like one of the things I find personally um, when it comes to kind of speaking about disabilities and the problems with disabilities is that some of the things you're saying seem so outrageous that you know, you're, kind of, you're kind of worried that the person you're saying them to is, isn't going to believe you. That you know, like that, that you must be exaggerating, or you must be making it up, because things can't be that bad, but they really, really are. Um, so it's like it's it's vitally important that you know we get this information out to as many people as we possibly can. And uh, like my hope for the the it's I suppose sorry, um, like my hope for the future is that like we can get disabilities at the forefront of policies and not as the afterthought, because right now, and especially in education, where it is so, so important uh, to, to bring about inclusion um, from the first day of school all the way through, it's very much an afterthought. It's, it's, it's an afterthought, like even how the special schools are placed, put together, where, where they put them and like how they're run. And the, the fact that they are so completely separate from the rest of education is wrong. Uh, when it comes to SEN in the mainstream schools, it's again an afterthought. Very often it's the resource teacher that's used uh, to plug holes when a mainstream teacher is out. That means there's no resource teacher, you know, and things like this. Like we have huge issues like all across education, but it, it goes further as well. There's, there's issues across huge issues across transport um, like we don't have we don't have proper changing facilities like in any of our cities you know so like and like these are basic things for people with specific sets of needs to just for them to be able to go about living their lives it's like you just put in this basic piece of infrastructure and all of a sudden you, you take someone who is now is currently living a very restricted life can now live a lot more independently and um, regardless of anything that's kind of pre preventing it it definitely shouldn't be our society that's preventing someone from living independently and right now that is the biggest disabler uh, for so many people um, with a huge variety of needs and um, so like uh, I'm really grateful Darvel, Rebecca and Rachel for the, the the work that you do and for spotlighting this and hopefully together going forward, we can start making things, see some greater improvement. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you. Okie doke. So I think we can call that a wrap. So. Bye. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks, Gavin. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Everyone, bye.